Okay, so we're here for our lesson four of Second Corinthians, and um, this week we want to always start out with a little bit of review so we kind of understand where we are and what we know, so that this chapter actually helps us, it helps us make sense of it. So um, in our study of Second Corinthians, and you might even talk about your, our study of First Corinthians somewhat, and really we've done a lot of cross-referencing so we can refer back to Acts and other places, um, the, the church at Corinth is who is being written to, but it also, this is going to go out into the area, the region of um, Acacia or Achaia, however that's pronounced, um, as most of Paul's letters did, they didn't just, that they were targeted to one group, but then they were shared with others. And of course we have them. So we get to share in the words and what is being said. We also know as Paul writes, he doesn't always say, okay, here's the next problem. <laughs> here's the next issue. He will write about the issue and then you can understand that there is an issue. And so um, number one, there are issues. <laughs> this is a church of people, and peopling is messy, and people are messy. We're all messy, um, but, and this was a church that Paul established. That was Paul's tendency, is go to areas where no one else had been, preach the gospel, a pure, unadulterated gospel, establish them. Now, in the case of the church at Corinth, in Paul's initial visit, how long did he stay? Do you remember? We looked it up in Acts. Was that a year and a half? Yes, it was a year and a half, 18 months, year and a half, um, which is actually, when you think about it, if you think about your own time, like if you were in a, a situation, even let's say a new believer, and you were immersed into some really great teaching for 18 months, that would be a pretty good establishment and a pretty good basis. Although none of us are done. You know, obviously that's not the last or final word, but they would definitely have gotten the gospel. They would have definitely gotten those basics. They would have definitely gotten the um the truths that would establish them firmly and they had Paul right there so they could also um, ask a lot of questions of him sorry I've got somebody coming in um, while he was there they could ask direct questions but there was also an ongoing relationship with the church at Corinth and how do we know that What's the, what's the, how did it look? What do we have that we know that shows that ongoing relationship? Well, apparently he wrote, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just the letters, I was going to say, just the letters. The letters definitely help us understand that. And he, um, he might refer to them in other letters as well um, to help us know that. But we know when we read 1 Corinthians that he had written, he had visited and he'd written. We know in 2 Corinthians, there is a letter uh, mentioned in 1 Corinthians that we don't know of. And then um, he's writing again in 2 Corinthians. So this is at least the third letter. We know he visited and he, we know in 2 Corinthians, he planned to visit again but he hadn't yet, and he had to explain himself, and this, again, is not just, you know, Paul's telling them, like, I think all of us would do this, if there was a reason, like, sometimes y'all will send me a, a message and say, I'm not going to be there, you know, for the, you know, you, you just let us know, right, Paul would have let them know that he wouldn't come, and he wouldn't have just ignored them, but what had happened as a result of him not coming is his critics had brought it as part of the stuff that they were beating Paul about. Basically saying, you know, he can't be trusted. You, you can't believe his word. Paul speaks up for himself. As I've said more than once, he speaks up for himself mainly because his word is attached to the words he has told them. So his good name, his word, his reputation, his authority, which is as an apostle, um, and as basically their father, their spiritual father, um, he has to keep in front of them his integrity, his truth, that he didn't just not come. 
that there was a reason for not coming. Um, there were probably various reasons, but one that we know about in 2 Corinthians is that when he had written that previous letter, it had caused them sorrow. And he wanted to write this letter so that he would come and the issues would be dealt with and he wouldn't be coming to cause them sorrow. Um, he knew that it had, but he ultimately even said that he himself really hadn't caused them sorrow. The situation he dealt with, the person who had caused that situation had caused them sorrow. And Paul was just the one that had to, as a parent dealing with issues, de deal with it. As an apostle dealing with issues, he had to deal with it. There's a lot that we can understand from this. And partly it is in our day and in the most of the churches I've been in, dealing with things is not the deal. <laughs> I mean, they would rather look at the person who's been hurt, look at the person who has been um, treated in badly, treated in an ungodly way. They would rather look at them and say, you just need to get over it. You just need to forgive. I've even been told if I bring something up, they're like, you're just bitter nice. <laughs> I mean, I have to, I have to search my heart and I have to know whether or not I am, but just by bringing up problems, that doesn't mean I'm bitter. And, and a lot of times there'll be an issue with a person and there's like a history of problems. And if you're bringing up that history, it's like, you know, you haven't forgiven, you're bringing up, you know, like you're, you're holding a grudge, you're bitter again. And it's like, um, or maybe I'm establishing a pattern. You know, you still don't see it as an issue. And until you do see it as an issue, you know, like if you're talking to someone in authority, you're not going to do anything about it. So if you're talking about one incident, yeah, I mean, yeah, we probably should just get over that. But if you're talking about, um, you're, if you're talking about a, a pattern of behavior, then definitely that needs to be dealt with. And chances are, if I've been hurt, somebody else has been too. And this is, again, what we've seen. We've seen the perpetrator of hurt be left alone and protected, actually, while just scores of people maybe have left the church even, maybe have questioned God even, but the authorities of the church just won't do anything about it. So we have a pattern here with Paul to see things need to be dealt with. Um, if you read through the Bible, Especially, I, I just, I'm just getting into, I'm in Joshua, so I've just gotten through, you know, the Pentateuch, the first five, the account of the Exodus, God dealt with things real quickly. <laughs> and then when we did our Acts study, you see in the very fresh early church where things were just really fresh, God dealt with things a lot of times very decisively. Um, I don't know why all the time now. He lets things slide more. Part of it is his grace and mercy. Part of it is he's waiting on us to do our what we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to deal with these things, especially if we're in a position of authority or ability to do something and we're protecting someone else. Um, that is that comes within our our purview and our, our realm. So Paul is dealing with issues. This issue had caused them sorrow. Apparently, they, he, had, he had written them to test them, see if they would be obedient, and they had done whatever it was, the issue. I believe it's possibly the 1 Corinthians 5 issue, but and we know about that one, but it could have been a different issue. And now he's saying, okay, you know, don't go so far that you never restore the person. It's now time to restore. Um, and if they had forgiven the person, then Paul was forgiving. And if you go back to 1 Corinthians 5, you see that they had not judged the man and apart from them, Paul had judged them. So you see this parallel. He had judged when they wouldn't. Now he's saying you've forgiven and I forgive with you. So he, he has this distance of geography, but he's right in the middle of their situations. And apparently there's a lot of back and forth information. So Paul's very aware of what's going on. So there's more than just the letters that we see. There is an ongoing relationship. And here's another thing about that. In a lot of ministries that go from city to city to city, you know, like evangelical ministries, a lot of times they don't come back and they don't 
keep on. They might do a halfway decent job or at least encouragement for that person to get plugged in into a local Christian community. But I don't know your experience. My experience is not all churches are great. <laughs> And, and there needs to be, you know, a way to find, especially for a new Christian, there needs to be a way to find and plug into a strong teaching, very good grounded church, not just one that has a lot of members, not just one that has all the bells and whistles, not just the closest one nearby, not just the denomination of choice, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, but that there needs to be some discernment. And to be honest with you, a brand new Christian doesn't have that. And so they can actually get into bad situations. But also it's more of the come in, do the show, have the people come forward. Let's write down the numbers and tell everybody about all the salvations. And then let's move on to the next town. And that's not the ministry of Paul. That's not the ministry of a true ambassador for Christ. So that's another thing that we see in Paul is this ongoing, constant prayer, communication, sometimes sending people to them, sometimes sending, getting people back from them to hear and, and get that. And this is all during a time where communication was a lot harder than it is today. I mean, we can literally pick up this amazing device and be in touch all the, uh, somewhat too much. <laughs> okay, then we go into chapter three, uh, at the end of chapter two, he talks about being that fragrance and that being it smells good to the ones that are uh, from life to life. And then it smells really bad to the ones that are perishing, um, but still a fragrance. It's not Paul's fragrance changed. <laughs> it's the same message, same message. That should be true of us. We should be carrying forth the message of God's word into the world all the time. And then we've got to be reminded it's not up to us whether or not they accept it. It's not up to us whether or not it smells good to them. Um, it may not. And it may be that we're just one of the people in time that will eventually, the truth will be unveiled to them. Then in chapter three, you get into where Paul talks about them the Corinthians being Paul's letter of commendation. He kind of, he asked the question, do I need a letter of commendation for you? And it might, he's dealing with issues. He's dealing with, he's got to, you know, come back and give forth his good name. And in also though, he's reminding them, you know me, you know who I am, you know what my message is. And I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have to tell you again. You know, I, should, I shouldn't have to have this conversation. So he's basically kind of saying it in a way where the answer is obvious to them, but it also raises the issue. And then he says, they are his letter to everyone. You know, and, and he, he says of the church at Corinth in both letters, he believes they're safe. Now, obviously in any group, you've got people who aren't who may think they are, who may have just infiltrated because they've got evil intent or may have infiltrated because they, they want the fellowship. They just don't really know how to get there. And, and hopefully in their association, they would come to know the truth. Chapter three is also the chapter that has more about the Holy Spirit than any other chapter in second Corinthians. And um, we are, Part, part of what it's talking about here is the ministry we have, which is in one case called the ministry of the spirit. What is the ministry of the spirit? What is another name for it? The new covenant. Yes. The new covenant, also called the ministry of righteousness. We could say the gospel any of, but the new covenant is, is, is specifically, and, and what it was saying here, it also contrasts in this chapter, the new covenant with the old covenant, mainly make part, well, partly at least, because he wants to focus on this new covenant. He wants us to realize that we have this ministry, but we're servants of it, you know, and realizing our role. Um, and if, you know, here in America, we don't like to think of ourselves in a status of servant, um, but, 
you know, you've heard it in church, so I'm sure this is not a new concept, but if you truly are a bond servant of Jesus Christ, and he truly is your master, capital M, master, Lord, can you tell him no? There's actually dual answers, yes and no. Yes, you can verbally say no, <laughs> and you can refuse, or you can not do what he wants you to do. But from the standpoint of if he truly is the master and you've truly submitted to him, then no, no. You need to be doing whatever he says you need to be doing. And we need to see it that way. We need to see our role as that of a bond servant or slave to a master. But that master is benevolent. That master has our best in mind. Our master has, our, has a task for us to do. Um, you know, we, again, as, especially as I get older, I get lazier and lazier. <laughs> I want to do less and less. I want to coast the rest of my life. But honestly, we were created for work. And if you don't believe that, go back to the account in Genesis, Adam and Eve prior to the fall, prior to the fall, had work to do. If you, if you read the accounts of the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem, we're not playing harps and laying around on clouds. I don't exactly know what it's going to look like, but it's not going to be nothingness. And if you've ever had true nothingness for a while, it's mind numbing and it's boring. And the Bible's even clear, you know, let the young widows remarry because if they've got time on their hands, they're just going to get into gossip and problems. And we all know we're a society of gossip and problems. <laughs> okay. So the um, chapter three talks about the veil, which was fascinating, the veil over Moses's face and the imagery that that gives us the pre um, prefiguring that that gives us to help us understand that I, all of us prior to our salvation had a veil over our hearts we could not really get it you know what the interesting about a veil is that Moses would have had a veil over says he would have been able to see through it to some extent otherwise you know he could have walked right so a veil isn't completely obscuring. It just doesn't make things clear. And certainly in the case of Moses' veil, it kept the people from being able to see the lessening of the glory, the fading of the glory on Moses' face. That was the, the point of it. That also points to the old covenant not being eternal, fading, and then eventually Jesus Christ fulfilling it and it no longer being, it just made it obsolete. There's, we don't throw it away. Jesus didn't throw it away. Jesus fulfilled it. Understand when, when you say he fulfilled it, that means he actually did the law, except for the sacrifices for sin, because he wouldn't need to do that. But the other things, he went to Passover. He died on Passover. He is Passover. You know, it's, it, he was, every part of the temple tabernacle whichever you want to look at he he fulfilled every bit of it all the prophecy there's one feast he hasn't fulfilled yet but he will he will he's fulfilled them all so he will feel, fulfill that one as well and so that's part of how the law has something to do in our lives it's real easy as New Testament Christians, as we call ourselves sometimes, to put the Old Testament, the Old Covenant away and say, I don't have anything to do with that. But we also don't need to drag it out and live by it as if it is our means of salvation. That's not good either. Because if we live by it as our means of salvation, we will die by it and pay the price for it. And Jesus paid that price. We don't need to. So now we get into 
chapter four. All of this is important because this is just the next thing, right? Because it starts with the word, therefore. <laughs> and therefore is always a throwback word. Look back and say, what was he talking about to understand what he's next going to say? He says, therefore, since we have this ministry, we've already named it. What is this ministry? The I think gospel. The gospel. Ministry of righteousness. Ministry of righteousness. Ministry of the new covenant. Ministry of the spirit. Yes. Any of those synonymous terms we can use. But that's the ministry. Okay. It doesn't say if you have that ministry. It says since we, all of us, have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we don't lose heart. Okay. Starts this chapter with the phrase, don't lose heart and then he ends this chapter the last cha the last paragraph with the phrase don't lose heart so what do you think this chapter might be about don't lose heart that's at least part of what it's about don't lose heart he says, we've renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adultering the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay, that's a lot of words that we all understood every one of those words, but we also still need to stop and unpack it, right? Number one, when he starts talking about walking in craftiness or uh, adulterating the word of God, did your mind flash back to a previous chapter where he says in the end of two, we are not like many peddling the word of God. And that word peddling is not just um, trying to sell it. It's the idea of corrupting it through that idea of trying to sell it to people or making money off of it in a way we shouldn't um, but as from sincerity as from God we speak in Christ in the sight of God you know Paul continues to remind whatever he does whatever we do God sees it and Paul is always aware of that he's not just warning he's aware of it and he's saying I know I'm doing everything in the sight of God therefore I'm careful I'm, I'm purposeful and I'm careful and he has expectations of God has expectations of Paul but then he says but by the manifestation of truth and I don't know if you mark manifestation or manifested but I hope if you didn't go back and mark it because we talked about the word and it manny like when you get a manicure manny means you can put your hands on it meaning it's visible it has it, it's shown in front of you it could be shown by your hands let's say manifested okay that's the way i remember it manifested um but by the manifestation of truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god again paul talking about commending um so he's not only talking about he has not adulterated the word he has not been doing things by craftiness, but he can commend himself in the sight of God to every man's conscience. So Paul has this ministry. We have this ministry. And as a result of having this ministry and having received mercy, we have a responsibility. And part of that responsibility is that before God and to man, two men, two people, we have a responsibility and we're to be giving it. And then he says in verse three, kind of stops for a second and says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. We go back to the fragrance. Those are some to some, it's to those that are perishing, it doesn't smell good. We also go back to chapter three, where it's talking about this veil and it's saying the veil is over the hearts still for those who are reading the Old Testament and don't get it until they turn to Christ and that veil is lifted. That veil is lifted because we don't turn to Christ unless God calls us. So we always have to go back. Don't start thinking, oh, I can just explain this to someone and they're going to do this on their own and that veil is going to go away. No. Pray hard that God will call them, have them to turn, and, and remove that veil. 
I don't know which comes in what order, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all part of it. And just keep that in mind. And it says, in, in the case of those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world was blinded, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay, you looked up some verses this week. Who is this God of this world? Wouldn't that be the devil? Yes. In all the cross-referencing you did, um, you know, we grew, if you grew up in church, you don't have a problem knowing in the creation account or the fall account in chapter three of Genesis that the serpent that comes into the garden is the devil. But it doesn't say that there. It does say it in Revelation. And that's the beauty of letting scripture interpret scripture. We don't have to look back and go, well, why do we call that serpent anything other than a serpent? You know, I mean, one bad apple, right? Sorry. I guess that's that <laughs> it might not have been an apple tree, but still we usually tend to think of it as an apple. Um, but but we saw in our cross-referencing, if you'd not seen it before, you now know firmly that the serpent of old, Satan, the devil, is also the dragon that of the future of Revelation, the future events of Revelation. That's in Revelation 12. In a nice in one verse, it puts it all together. But he also, that doesn't tell us it's the God of this world until you did your other cross-referencing and you begin to see um, the God of this world. This also took me, um, as I was doing this, I was thinking, and I think we did look it up, in the um, Ephesians 6, full armor of God. You know, the, the battle we wage in this world, we're looking at a person, that person is bothering us in some way or form or fashion, or hopefully it's not us, but we're looking at that other person and they're doing this. And we have a tendency to pray about that person and making that person stop or whatever. Hopefully it's not imprecatory prayers of zap them. <laughs> I want to do that, but I try not to, um, or I ask God forgiveness for those thoughts anyway, and leave it in God's hands, but we need to be reminded. I was reminded again this week that the battle is really behind the scenes and there are, there are principalities and powers of darkness that are going on. And again, this God of this world is a God of chaos. He's, he's called, um, when Jesus was talking to those people that were against him all the time, he said, your father, they thought their father was the heavenly father. And he said, no, it's not. Your father is the God of this world. He is a father of lies. He's the liar from the beginning. He's a murderer from the beginning. And he lies because it's his nature to lie, talking about the devil. And then he was saying to all of them, he begat you. He's your father. And they didn't like it. <laughs> they really didn't like it. Okay, so um, he says that of these people who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they may not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay, so this week we did quite a bit of work on this idea of light. So let's talk about that for a little bit. What did you learn about light this week? Some of it you can get from right here in this verse. It's of the gospel is one of the things it says, right? But it also says, what is this light? Christ. Yes, Jesus. Jesus, it's Jesus himself. Um, and we see that from John, John 1, right? That um, the light came into the world it, the darkness could not comprehend it, and it's talking about Jesus himself. Okay, so starting out with Jesus being this light is very important for us to understand. Jesus is the light. Here, when he says um, in verse 6, for God said, light shall shine out of the darkness, that is a reference, that is a direct quote from where?
That's a direct quote from Genesis 1 1. Oh, yes. Or Genesis 1 2, I'm sorry, or 1 3. Um, wait a minute, let me see. It says Genesis 1 3. You know, the world was void and dark was over the, the surface of the deep. And then God says, let there be light and light shone. And I say shone, light shined out of the darkness. That's a direct quote here. Okay, so when he just said that in verse five, that, um, sorry, in verse four, he said the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. And he says, who is the image of God? In John 1, we see the light is Jesus. And then knowing that this is a cross-reference cross back to Genesis 1-3, we know that the light that God was talking about that he brought forth was the Christ, was Jesus Christ. Okay, now don't confuse that thinking that in Genesis 1-3, Jesus was created because he wasn't. He was not created at that point. He existed at that point. If you look at, is it Galatians? One of the other epistles of Paul where God says that from him and through him and for him, all things came into being. He's talked to him as Jesus. So all of creation came to be for Jesus from Jesus and through Jesus. There's there's different prepositions. And it covers it all. It, it really helps us understand. So the light at creation is this light and it's Jesus himself. But we also, if, if, if that's a concept that's hard to understand, think about in Revelation, when there's a new heaven and a new earth and new Jerusalem that are coming down out of heaven after this world that we're living in is done away with, the light of that new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem is God and Jesus themselves. There's no longer a son, no longer a need for a son, S-U-N, son, because the son, S-O-N, is the light and the, the lamp of the world. So don't get too hung up in those, those things, those, those truths and differences. Just understand that this is, this is all of what God is telling us in this, and it's all true. But it's also talking about the light of the gospel, the light that shines out of darkness. Um, and it says, he is the one who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Um, so So when it says here in the face of Christ, that may mean like in front of Christ, because that's kind of how we use the phrase sometimes, you know, if I, if I did something in your face, it would be right, like right in front of you, or it might mean like his literal face, like Moses's face shown. We saw also in Jesus's life, his ministry, his earthly ministry, his um, transfiguration on the mountain, and he like his glory just came out from the inside out is the way I look at it. Um, it's like he, he was stopped suppressing it in a way it's, he, he isn't a reflection of God. Like we need to be a reflection of God's glory. He is God's glory. He is the image of God. We're made in their image. Jesus is the image. It's incredible when you think about it. Um, last week I talked a little bit about the glory and I talked about like reflecting like a mirror, you know, just that if somebody looks at me figuratively, they need to be seeing God. They need to be seeing Jesus when they look at me, if I'm living my life, right, not me. So if, if, as Paul says, it's not of myself, whatever I'm doing that I'm doing for God is not of myself, but am I doing it? Yes. Am I walking in obedience? Yes. Do I have a role? 
Yes. Am I a servant of this, this new covenant? Yes. I, I'm part of it. But it is, it's, it's God's glory shining back, reflecting back from me. I don't have it in me. And, and one of the easy ways to kind of understand this, and God gave us this so that we can understand it, is the sun and the moon. And we all know that there are, even in creation account, it talks about the lights that God put in the heavens, the sun for day, and the stars and the moon for night. So we're just going to talk about the moon, not the stars, but the stars and the moon for night. From the, we know, because we know more now, it's not really explained to us in the creation account, but we know the moon in and of itself has no ability to have light, but the sun does. The sun is light and, and God put it there. The sun is the center of our universe. We wrap ourselves around it. Um, I was just noting this morning when, um, like something was messing up on my computer. Um, when I was sitting outside, the difference, that different angle, like if you were looking out my front window, the sun comes up over here in the summer, but pretty, it's already over here now, and pretty soon it'll be over here. And that is because we know, well, I've, got a, I've got a globe, but it's too heavy. Let me see if I've got something round. We know that the earth is round, but if you put a axis through it, if you don't see that, put an axis through it, what happens is as we travel around the sun, you see how this axis is at a different place. So it's like we're tilted. Um, it's at a different angle away from the sun and that creates the summer and the winter. That means that our hemisphere is closer when it's, when it's on this side and it's farther away when it's on the other side. Um, that's the winter part. It also makes the sun coming up, come up at a different place. And we look at it from our, you know, human perspective, the sun coming up and going down. But we know sun stays still, we move. And over the course of a year going around the sun, our relative position to the sun shifts and changes. And it changes that angle. It changes the, the, the temperature. It changes all those things. Pretty fascinating. Um, I don't know if y'all have encountered this, but I actually encountered somebody a couple of years ago that believes that we live on a flat earth. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know they still existed, but she was dead serious. And, and honestly, I talked to her, I've talked to her enough to know she studies the Bible and she's firmly convinced we live on a flat earth. And I just kept looking at her and I was like, at first, I thought, well, you know, like this is an interesting thing to talk about, but I was looking at her going, um, I don't know if you know this, but my husband is a pilot and he's literally flown around the world, like around the world. And he's seen it. She didn't believe me. And I said, well, you know, there's been rockets that go up. That didn't happen. <laughs> Satellite <laughs> images are all made up. I mean, let's just, let's just deny all of this. Um, and I was like, but what would be the point? I mean, seriously, it would have to like flip. And, and, and I kind of just said something, she said, we'd all fall off. Well, you know, in essence, we don't fall off the earth because of gravity. Um, otherwise we would, <laughs> when it's rolling around, right? We would fall, we'd stumble all the time. Um, but yeah, she, she firmly believes it. And crazy, fascinating. But it doesn't, if you believe in that, it doesn't explain the angle change of the, the setting and rising of the sun. It doesn't explain the temperature change. It doesn't explain a lot of things, let alone why you would want to believe that. But, and I told her, I said, well, the Bible even talks about the world being a sphere. And she said, no, that's not talking about sphere. Or she might think it's a round, like it's not a square, it's a round flat. Because I was even talking about, well, if you look outside, you turn a circle, you the, the horizon doesn't fall off, you know. And she's like, well, it's it's a round flat. <laughs> okay, back to the moon. <laughs> 
The sun and moon are great examples for us to look at and know that what happens is the sun shines on the moon and the light we see from the moon at night is just a reflection of the light from the sun. We are the moon to God and Jesus. They, they shine on us and we reflect that. And guess what? It shines in the darkness. <laughs> we get to shine in the darkness. Isn't that cool? Okay, so here's one of those stupid ph philosophical questions. I hate those stupid philosophical questions. Like, if a tree falls in the wilderness and no one is there to hear it, does it make noise? Yes, it does, by the way. But anyway, doesn't have to be recorded, doesn't have to be heard. That is a very uh, self-centered, humanistic point of view to think that we're so important that we have to be there to hear it. Okay, but here's the thing. When we can't see the moon, is the sun still shining on it? Yeah. When we can't see the moon during the daytime, for instance, when we've got our back turned to it or whatever, <clears throat> or the sun is out and so bright, sometimes, you know, you wake up and you can actually see the moon as the sun is coming up, but it's not, it's just a white thing in the sky. It's not shining like, but is it, is it not shining? It is shining. It's like the flashlight I talked about last week. Take a flashlight out pre-dusk and it's going to be really bright and helpful. But if once the sun comes up, you're not even going to notice it. Not even going to notice the, that they're flashlights. You probably run your batteries down because you forget to turn it off. But the moon, no matter what. Now we've watched the moon's crescents. We've watched and we know we can look at that and know now that that's just a shadow of the earth because there's enough of the earth between the sun and the moon to cut out a part and we've seen eclipse of the moon to know that there was enough of a shadow of the world of our earth but even then you see that glow around it it's kind of cool um so here's the thing no matter what no matter what is blocking no matter what is 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 um between or even how someone perceives you and me god's light is still shining on us and our light is still shining forth. And here's what sometimes we do. We only shine in a room full of other moons where nobody notices our brightness. Instead, God wants us to go out of that room and into the dark world where our light draws, our light is noticeable. Our light's gonna draw negative attention too. And there's going to be those that want to block it. Isn't that a great picture that God gave us that we can see daily? I mean, I was literally just out there this morning going, oh, yeah. And also just that path. I, I've never lived in a place where I saw sunrises and sunsets as clearly as here. And we've lived here longer than I've ever lived anywhere. And to watch that progression fascinates me because I always go that way's east. And then I go, well, wait a minute, that way's east. <laughs> So I guess it's somewhere in between. I mean, if there was a true east, it's, I guess it's, I don't even know how you determine that. It's somewhere in the middle. It's that way, um, basically. So I'll let some wiser minds know. But understanding this light, it's the light that sh shone in the darkness in Genesis 1-3. Jesus was there already. But he was more than just a participant. He was more than just one of the Godhead. He was the light. I just think it's awesome. And then we see John 1 also telling us that this light came into the world and the darkness couldn't comprehend it, can't still comprehend it. Yet he still shone brightly. And he was the true light. That's another thing it talks about him being the true light. I know most weeks I go through paragraph by paragraph. I just thought this whole light thing was just so important. Um, and then it goes on. Um, and it will, So if we look at verses one to six, which is all we've covered so far, as far as reading, um, you can see that Jesus's glory, that's the other thing, is he, it's the glory of Christ. Again, that's that. It's not the glory of reflection. Like we have the glory that we reflect of God. It, he is the glory, just as the Father, and he's the image of God. 
So it's really important to understand that part about him. And then, um, but this first paragraph is just talking about Jesus's glory is the light of the gospel that shone into the, or out of the darkness. I mean, that's how I summarize the first paragraph. You can summarize it similarly what, to your own. The next chap, next paragraph is seven through 12. And it talks about the, the this treasure we have. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Again, Paul's always making sure the power is of God, not of ourselves. But what is it saying this treasure is? This treasure is what we're talking about here. This ministry we have, this glory that we get to reflect, this light that shines on us, um, this ministry of the new covenant. Also, it says that the, in verse eight, we are afflicted in every way, way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted. I hope you wrote this down as a list somewhere, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be, what's that word again, manifested in our body. For we live constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Those two verses are essentially saying exactly the same thing. Okay, the conclusion or the outcome is that Jesus's life is shown or manifested in our lives, in my body, in my flesh. He put it as that, not just body like some figurative thing, because there were a lot of philosophies in that day that didn't believe in a literal mortal like Jesus, or that, you know, we are spirit versus flesh, not spirit and flesh together, because we are spirit and flesh together, you can't separate them. And it's important that that he's saying here that this is manifested in our body, manifested in this mortal flesh while we're alive. Um, and I don't want to push past all those those things of affliction because affliction is a theme throughout this book. We need to constantly be reminded. But each time it's but not, but not, but not. Um, it's very important. But he's also painting a picture in all of those words about affliction, different. And I, I marked them all the same way. I said, you know, the persecuted, afflicted, perplexed, struck down, caring about and delivered over. I marked them all the same way I marked affliction. You don't have to, but I did. Because I just want to glance down the page and see all of those. Um, and then the buts um, in contrast. And I mark those and I mark the, the what's being contrasted too. But when you look at constantly being delivered over to death, again, we talked about this last week, Paul is not a complainer. He's not somebody that's making things up. He's not making things that are bigger than they already, you know, than they really are. Like he's not a whiner. He literally means that their life is, that his life and hit, and we see this, but this through his statements that we've already seen, some of the cross-referencing, his life was forfeit so many times over and over and over. You and I may not be facing that same level of persecution, but we might someday, and we might in a smaller way. And here's the thing, you know, God's not looking at us and saying, your pain is not as great as somebody else's pain. So you're not as important as they are. Stop whining. My issues are important to God. Your issues are important to God. We shouldn't make more of them than they are, don't get me wrong, but God cares. And in each of them, we learn and we grow and we can always know that we're not crushed. We're not despairing. We're not destroyed, certainly not forsaken. And we carry about in this body that dying all the time. It may be their lives are at, are at risk. And that's very true of Paul's life. But we certainly know what Jesus told us is that we're to die to self and we're to take up our cross every day, right? So if nothing else, as we became a Christian, we died to that old self and we carry that in our bodies all the time. 
And again, that's not going to be something the world really understands. So verse 12, it says, so death works in us, but life in you. Okay, he, he's not saying they don't have afflictions and they don't have persecutions. He's saying, as he has said before, what Paul experiences, what you and I experience when we're relating that to other people, it is a, a point of hope. It's, it's good for them to understand that we're living through it, that God is not forsaking us, that he is delivering us, that we haven't been destroyed. We may die because of one of these events, but we still haven't been destroyed nor forsaken um, and, and we're not sparing, hopefully. But it also is, these are reminders to ourselves. Sometimes we need to go back and read this list. I may be despairing and I may say, stop despairing. I may be perplexed um, and, and in, in that sense, I, but then I have to like stop myself and say, no. This is what, this is not just what Paul says. It's not a denial. I'm reading this really good devotional. And he has said that the true grace of God is not denying reality. It's understanding the reality and knowing God's right there in the middle of it. And a lot of times people want us to be that Pollyanna, that, oh, everything's okay. Or we go into church. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. And then we walk away, you know, like guts hanging out. You know, we're dragging along our burdens and and sometimes it's just not the time to say it but we do have problems so verses 7 to 12 i how would you what do you think he is the best uh summary of those for that paragraph That Christ is going to be seen in us in every one of these situations that's um, mentioned, and that's how we need to live our life daily because we don't know when we're going to get perplexed or, you know, that sort of thing. That our reaction is going to speak Jesus to other people. Absolutely, I mean that is absolutely true, um, and and I'm glad that's what you got out of those verses because it's very much a part of what we need to be reminded of. Um, and, and to use words that are right there in the text, you could say either any of those affliction words, um, or even those last two that are, or not the last two, but 10 and 11, you could say carrying about dying, or you could say constantly being delivered over, like being delivered over to death, that Jesus's life is manifested. You know, you were saying shown, and I'm just going to use the word that's there manifested. Um, so that's what I put together. Obviously, there's a lot there, but if that helps me remember it um, or helps you remember it, put that down. And then verses 13 to 15, um, it says, but there's a contrast, it seems, but having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believed, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Christ and will present us with him for all things are for our sakes that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Okay, when we stopped and looked this week up, uh, we looked at the cross-referencing of this whole, I believed, therefore I spoke, which was um, from Psalm 116. Um, in that psalm, the psalmist basically says something, it seems like he says it backwards. Like, but here again, Paul is saying, Paul kind of says it backwards too. I believed, therefore I spoke. And then he says what he believed. What he believed was that God raised Jesus from the dead. And honestly, if you wonder how much power God has, We've got many accounts in scripture. Again, I just read through the Exodus account. It's incredible. It's incredible over and over and over again. Things that God only did one time in those, some of those cases, only did one time. But he brought the world into creation by speaking. How important is the word? How important? I mean, even in John 1, Jesus is called the logos, the, uh, the word, the, the spoken word. Um, he's called the light. It's called a lot of things. It's, it's all important. But we believe 
therefore we speak. And what do we speak? We speak, if you went to take this back to all of those afflictions, we speak, doesn't matter what happens to me, I know that God raised Jesus from the dead and he will raise me too. Not just raise me, but present me. Don't, don't miss that part. Present me with all of us. So this isn't just a Paul talking about Paul or Paul talking about his close friends or Paul even talking about the Corinthians. This is the us. This is all of us, all Christians, not all people, but all Christians that we can know, we can absolutely know that he will raise us with Jesus and will present us um, with you. Like I would say that of us. It's awesome. And then it says, for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause. So I just summarize that with God will raise us with Jesus. You can put whatever you want to there. It's a promise and it's something that we can hold firm to. And then the last three verses, 16 to 18, again, he says, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, does that ring bells with what we saw before? Right? We're caring about in our body the dying of Christ. We are being delivered over. That's a little bit of a difference. You know, I, the first one may be me um, caring about. In other words, I'm dying to self. Um, the other is we're aging. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> so we know that we're caring about the decaying of our bodies, right? <laughs> uh, but we also know it's part of being human. You know, part of being alive is that aging process. So it could be any and all of those things, but mainly it's talking about where our outer man is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed. So it really doesn't matter what's going on out here. It doesn't matter if your strength is failing, if you're not able to do the things that you used to do, my inner person is being renewed. But I think more this is bigger. I think this is more about dying to your old self. Um, and in and, and manifesting and showing that both the dying of Jesus and the life of Christ in our lives. Then it says in verse 17, and I know you've heard this verse before, but we're putting it in context. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, is he really talking about light affliction? No, a lot of times he's talking about bad, 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 bad things. And it's not just a comparison, even though there is a comparison. What I'm dealing with right now in comparison to what I get in heaven. Yeah, this is nothing. This is nothing. This is, this is no big deal, right? And like I even said before, sometimes we know, I mean, one of the good parts of comparison can be, I can be whining about what I call a stub toe issue as I'm, and this always goes back, as I was at Bible study and listened to my friends, the hum of her little scooter as she came in because she could no longer walk because she had MS. And it always put my stuff in perspective. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good part of comparison, putting things in perspective. But mainly here, this is a perspective of, again, eternal weight of glory as opposed to what I'm dealing with now, okay? But that's the way I've always looked at that verse, which is not bad, that's, but there's more there. There's a word there that I want you to see. It says producing. All that we're dealing with is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. God has a purpose in it. We know that. I just had to be reminded of that again with some of the stuff I'm going through. I had to be reminded that I keep thinking, I keep focusing on the affliction or the people, like I said, the spiritual warfare, I got to change my mind about that. Or even the crazy chaos we're, we're dealing with, not just in our country, but going on in the world, but especially going on in our country. I sit around going, we're literally potentially seeing the end of what we know as the United States of America. It's, it's, it's fracturing right in front of our eyes. 
and I was like fussing about this person and thinking about that group or or organization or whatever else. Instead, I started going, I need to be praying against the powers and the principalities and the powers of darkness and the God of this world who's blinded people. I need to be praying for their souls, not, not Satan's souls and the power souls, but the people's souls. We need to be praying that God would lift the veil, that reason would return. That's how I've been praying lately. And, but knowing here what we're dealing with, whether it's collectively we're all dealing with this mess or whatever you're dealing with in your life, it's producing something in you. That's a totally different viewpoint. And it, it's, it, to me, it's incredible. Um, I hope it is for you. I just, I looked at that word this week and I went, I've always thought my afflictions versus heaven. And, and I do believe there's a comparison there that we, we can see, but it's more than that. It's saying, um, this is the idea of laying up treasures. This is the idea of this working in me to change me more and more into the image of Christ. And if I see it that way, I actually am glad. And I can actually thank God, even when I don't understand it, I still don't understand. It. And I don't know that I ever will, whatever's going on and why people are doing what they're doing and the hurts and the, it just doesn't make sense and the injustice of it. Um, sorry, I've got a lot of that going on right now. But in verse 18, it says, while we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And, and those of us who've done the study of the tabernacle, those of us who've done the study, some of the studies before, we know that when God gave them the pattern for the tabernacle, it was a shadow of the heavenly. A shadow means that there's something of substance with a light force, a light shining on it that cast a shadow. And really all of what we see, all that we can knock on, all that we can feel and touch, all that we can see, smell, to eat, all of our senses, right now, it's temporary. It's temporary. It's all going to go away. But what do we do? We get up every day. We see this as permanent. We see this as sun come up, sun go down. Everybody expects that. Life's going to go on. We might have some fears, we might have some problems, but we can count on the ground. We can count on that mountain. We can count on the sky. We can count on these things. And God's still going to do away with all of that, all of it, and start over. So if we can see these things that way, it changes our perspective. And backing up, it changes our perspective on affliction. It changes our perspective on the decaying of this while the inner man is being renewed. That's the important part. It, it takes all of the things that we are looking at here and goes, what can we know? We cannot, we can know that we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. We have all these promises. We have all of these, these absolutes and all of this stuff that we're dealing with is not, it doesn't matter overall in light of the light that shines from us because of the light that's shining on us. It's an amazing lesson. <laughs> and you can see why Kay was talking about how important this chapter is. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I was just going through it. <laughs> All of a sudden these truths are hitting me and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. This chapter is one that I will come back to over and over and over again for not just those words of, you know, afflicted and every way, but not crushed, perplexed. I mean, there's songs about this and whatever. Those are fascinating and awesome. And I need to grab onto those. But I tell you, verse 17 is almost like a life first now. It's that important. But also back up. Don't lose heart. <laughs> verse 1, verse 16. Don't lose heart. We don't need to lose heart. So Paul's talking about his circumstances to a group who are also facing affliction. But he's talking to us. 
I'm talking to you who are facing affliction. I don't know all of your day-to-day -day life circumstances. You don't know all of mine, but it's not good. Um, most of it is, <laughs> there's a lot that's good. There's a lot that's good. But I, have some, I mean, just my mom won't speak to me and it's cut me out of her life. Three of my sisters are attacking me every chance they get. You, Some of you know, I've got a son who, I mean, it's like, I've gone to counseling because I'm like, what is wrong with me that all these people, you know, and, and it's not that I don't have any, anything to do with it, but basically it comes down to this. It comes down to I'm different and they, I won't do what they want me to do if I think it's wrong and they can't handle that they want to tell me what to do and and i'll do what people want me to do if i can if it doesn't violate what god would want me to do but i can't always do what they want me to do and i didn't realize we lost martha somewhere along the way um okay so let's finish with prayer i felt like i just talked sorry <laughs> this is supposed to be discussion <laughs> um incredible stuff though i uh, hope you're getting a lot of it i've already told some if you didn't hear me earlier we are not meeting next week i will put it in the email but we are not meeting next week we will not do two lessons in two weeks we will do one lesson we'll do lesson five um two weeks from now which is i think the what would that be the uh, october 12th i think not sure about that whatever that tuesday is um i'll put it in the email I will, I do have a few prayer requests. I'll stick those in. I'm sorry. I'm still not good about sending those out when I get them. I keep thinking I'm going to collect them and then I let it, I get distracted. Um, I'll get better, but so forgive me for that, but let's pray. And then those of you who want to stay can stay for the video. Gracious and kind heavenly father, the light of the world. Thank you that you are not only the light of the world, that you are the logos that was spoken in, spoke the world into existence. You are reflecting your glory onto us. And Lord, I pray that I can reflect your glory back, that the world will see it. I know that's going to cause me problems and it's also going to cause me blessings. Um, but I know that it also, all these afflictions are producing in me an eternal weight of glory. Again, glory, glory, glory. I thank you for all of that. And I thank you a lot, Father, for the understanding that these are not just words. These are not just like uh, lyrics, even sometimes that we just don't stop and think of the meaning. I just thank you that we get to dig deep and that we can come together and we can discuss it and then we can listen to more of what Kay has to say. But thank you more than anything for these words, for preserving, preserving them for us and for us to be able to be right here, right now, studying them together in light of what's going on in the world around us. But we do ask, Father, for that world around us, for this country, that there's just so much evil going on right now. And we know that God of this world is behind it and you have overcome him. That all of these statements of we, that we don't need to be, to, we can be perplexed sometimes, but we don't need to despair. We can be crushed down, but we're not um, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We carry about in our body the deliverance of death in, so that Jesus's life is manifested. That is what we hope, that we can be that person. Keep us in this chapter reminded that that's the purpose of in our lives, but also the purpose of the afflictions, but mainly the purpose of your light shining on us. And we also know that we're not going to be exempt from persecution because you weren't. And as the more we look like you, the more we align ourselves with you, the more the world is going to hate us. And that hatred is coming at us now, Lord, in, in waves here, especially in this country. It's scary. It is perplexing, but I'm not despairing. I know you're greater than all of that and you have a plan and a purpose in it. And if it is bringing about the end times that much more quickly, Lord, I say, bring it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I look to the sky. I look to the sky ready to fly. And I thank you for this lesson, for what we're going to hear from Kay, for the coming lesson and my time away and our time apart. I just ask that you give us time to catch up, reflect on these things, and do our work for next time. 
We thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Self-recording.